morning, everybody. It's good to see everyone this morning. We welcome you to our morning service here at Penn Street United Methodist Church. And welcome to everybody watching online. We're glad you're joining us as well. Uh, hope everybody is staying cool in this excessive heat and uh, following safety protocols. And we're glad you're taking some time out of your Sunday to worship with us this morning. Uh, Ed has some announcements to make, and then we will begin our service. Ed? Just one major announcement. Uh, during the week, uh, the cleaning lady was up and she was storing some of her working equipment in the old choir room. And if you may remember when we did the remodeling in here, we did some work in there too, but they never really finished it off. We decided not to spend the extra money at that point to redo the floor and things like that. Had to do the ceiling, but nonetheless didn't do the floor at all. Well, as it turns out, the air conditioning unit that services Travis's office in that room and, and the uh, copy room, uh, the, I don't know what you call that, the drain where it takes the uh, moisture out of the, out of the air and goes out, got clogged up. And of course, it created a leak. And we had water all over the floor and, that sort of thing. The floor was not finished off, so it didn't create a big amount of damage. Uh, it, Kyle came up and looked at it, and the next day we got uh, mix air conditioning guys out here, and they cleaned it out and this and what. And I looked at it yesterday, and it's really not, uh, it's a minimal amount of damage, it seems to me. So at some point, we'll decide what to do with that room and go from there. But uh, the air conditioner, was cleaned up and fixed and so should be working now okay i don't know of any other announcements right off does anybody have anything i'm going to do this if if you haven't been back and looked at the floors the kitchen floor and that back hallway take the time to do it sometime mary elena on her own initiative she's our cleaning lady now is coming up here two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening and cleaning those floors. And you can tell exactly where she cleaned and where she didn't. She was so disgusted with the state of the floors and things from the previous cleaning people that she's just going all out to get it back in shape. And of course it was her that was being up here and putting her, some of her equipment in that room that found the leaks. So, and also so found that, the fleas. And the fleas that time we had with the fleas. So we've had some residual good work from that. Well, if there are no other announcements, let's all stand and join in our call to worship. We are called to bring a new understanding of God, that God so loved the world. We are, we are, the of the earth. We are called to bring a new hope in God, that God gives us new life. We are, we are the light of the world. We are called to follow the commandments and the law. The law. Oh, God, 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 Come, let us be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Come, Come let us love one another with the love of God. Let us join together in our love of God to worship and follow Jesus. And our opening hymn is number 453, More Love to Thee. More love to Thee, O Christ, more love to Thee. Hear Thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earth and more love, O Christ, to Thee. Oh 
who's been on our uh, prayer list of uh, among our homebound members for a long time. Uh, Dixie passed away this morning. She had been in uh, the SP JST nursing home for the past several years in declining health, and uh, Dixie was just a few months shy of 99 years old. And uh, Sammy uh, tweeted, uh, Ed and Susan, that said, my mother graduated to heaven this morning. So we want to keep Owen and Sammy and their family in our prayers and the uh, loss of Sammy's mother, Dixie Reed. Thank you for reminding me of that, Susan. And are there other prayer requests? Are there any birthdays or anniversaries in the coming week? Well, let's spend a moment in silent meditation and you can share with God whatever's on our hearts. <clears throat> and then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer and we'll join the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of this day. We're grateful that we can come together in your house today to worship you together, to enjoy fellowship with one another. We ask your blessings on our church as we seek to be in ministry for you and our community in these challenging times. We ask that you would be with us and protect us and all of our loved ones in our community in this excessive heat we are experiencing. We pray that you would bless our region with desperately needed running to bring an end to this drought and the heat wave. We ask that you would be with uh, Owen and Sandy and their family uh, this morning. Comfort them in the loss of Dixie. Give them your grace, your peace, your comfort at this time. We thank you for Dixie's life and her uh, faith in you and her love for her family. We ask that you would bless Mary Helen Abernathy and continue to bring healing to her. That you would bless Susan and continue to bring healing to her. And we ask that you'd be with the people of Ukraine and Russia and this war that neither of them really wanted, that their lead, uh, power mad leader got them into. We pray that you would be at work to ease the pain and suffering to restore peace to that troubled region. Guide the leaders of our world in uh, the ways they can work to bring an end to this conflict. We ask that you be with Marie Warnke and Denise Risotto. Bring healing to them. We pray for Danny and Cindy Graham that you would give them comfort and peace. We ask that you would continue to bring healing to Manny and to Betty that you would bring healing to Lynette, that you would um, be with all the other names on our prayer list, and the names that are not written down or spoken aloud but are very real in our hearts. We offer them up to you. We pray for healing for Lynette Tucker as well. Bless us now in our worship and our service to you, and help us to live each day as Jesus taught us to live when he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of heaven. Now we have a message for our young disciples. We're glad you all are joining us online with your parents today. We welcome you. From time to time, I like to uh, tell you a little bit about our altar here at church. You know, uh, the things we have on the altar are not there by accident. When you see the candles and the cross and the Bible, on the altar in the churches, they tell you a lot about what we believe as Christians. The cross is always the center of the altar in a church, and the cross is there because it reminds us of Jesus and how Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again to give us eternal life. 
And you would notice that our cross, like many altar crosses, has three letters on it. I-H-S. Uh, I-H-S is a Christian symbol that dates back to the uh, about the 5th century. It comes from the first three letters of uh, Jesus' name in the Greek language in which the New Testament was written. Iesus. Uh, the Greek letters Iota, Eta, and Sigma in the Greek language. But uh, in the Middle Ages, when people spoke Latin, uh, people came to believe that these letters uh, stood for uh, a phrase in Latin, Iesus, uh, Hominum, Soter. That's a mouthful of fancy words that you don't need to remember. But in Latin, that means Jesus, Savior of humanity. So when you're in a church sometime and you see the cross and the letters IHS on it, it reminds us of the name of Jesus and that Jesus is our Savior, the Savior of all people. We keep candles on the altar because of the flame of the candles reminds us of God's presence with us. It reminds us of His Holy Spirit. We light the candles at the start of the church service uh, because they remind us that God is with us when we worship. And it reminds us of the presence of God in our midst. And the Bible is at the center of the altar because as Christians we believe that the Bible is God's word to us. The Bible contains God's uh, teachings for us that God wants us to follow. And the Bible is our authority for living the Christian life. So the altar tells us a lot about uh, what uh, we believe as Christians. So the next time you see the altar and see the cross and the candles and the Bible, uh, it reminds us of some of the important things we as Christians believe. It's the way we can remember what uh, being a Christian is all about. And now our next hymn is number 714. I know whom I have believed. I know not by God's wondrous grace to me had made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know Yeah. 
the ushers will come forward, we'll receive our morning offering. Let's have a prayer and ask God's blessing on the offering this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts you've given to us. Bless this morning's offering that it may be used to further the work of your church in our community and throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. being presented, let's all stand and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures Nobody was panicking. 
When they got down to about the 33rd floor, they suddenly felt the whole building shut. And uh, Jim said he wondered what could make a building that huge shake so much. He figured the fuel tank on the airplane must have exploded. So he called his wife on his cell phone to let her know that he was on his way out of the building, that he was okay. His wife had been watching the whole thing on the news that morning. And she said, I'm watching it on the news right now. They're speculating that a small private plane crashed into the tower. And Jim said, no, it wasn't a small plane. It was a commercial airliner. I just saw it. He began to see some injured people on the stairwell. And uh, emergency workers and police were taking care of them. They finally made it down to the lobby and they could see out the lobby doors into the plaza outside. There was a lot of thick smoke and the plaza was covered in debris. Policemen were there telling them not to go out to the plaza, but to go into the subway and move through the subway and come back outside several blocks to the north. So Jim, his friends and others uh, moved down to the subway and they walked across the train platform to a stairwell that led up to the street about two blocks north of the World Trade Center. When they emerged into the sunlight, uh, the, the area was crowded with people. They were all looking back towards the World Trade Center. Jim looked in that direction and said he saw that uh, the North Tower was now on fire and there was fire coming from the South Tower just a short distance away from, their meet from where their meeting had been held. Uh, policemen were moving among the crowd telling everybody to make their way north. As they moved north, Jim got separated from his friends. Uh, he managed to convince an off-duty New York taxi cab driver to drive him and some other folks uptown. The taxi cab driver had his radio on. They heard about the second plane that had hit the towers. They heard about the plane that had hit the Pentagon. And Jim's heart broke in anguish as all our hearts did that day. He looked out the rear window and saw the North Tower collapse. And then a short while later, he heard on the radio that the South Tower had also collapsed. He was thinking about all those innocent people who had not made it out as he did. He had the cab driver drop him off at a car rental agency. He rented a car and drove all the way back to Texas. The next Sunday, he and his wife and some friends of theirs were in church and they were passing a box of tissues around among themselves as they wiped the tears from their eyes. And Jim said he realized that day what a precious gift life is. How every day is a gift from God to be cherished. How every moment with our loved ones is a gift from God to be cherished. And he said that over and over in the days following 9-11, people would ask one another, how can people do something that horrible and call it holy? Well, it brings to mind the question of why are bad things often done in the name of religion? You know, that there's, there's good religion and there's bad religion. And how do we tell the difference? One of my professors at Baylor, Dr. Hilbert, once told us that religion is probably the most powerful thing in the world. And it can be used either for great good or for great evil, depending on the use people put it to. Dr. Gilbert said to us that when you study the three major religions in our world, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, you find that most adherents to those three great monotheistic religions are compassionate, peace-loving, kind, and gentle people. But each one of those faiths also contains a radical fringe element that tends to go off the deep end and use religion as a source for division and hatred instead of for good. You know, a good religion can motivate people to do good and wondrous and godlike things to make the world a better place. But bad religion can motivate people to do hateful, cruel things and 
Also, don't even lead them to murderous acts. One, of their, there are certain things that all the extremist groups in religion have in common. The groups that practice what we might call bad religion, you can usually spot them because they all have certain characteristics. For one thing, they're characterized by a closed mind. They are not open to new truth of any kind. Those who practice bad religion, they say, this is our interpretation of the scripture. Don't question it. Don't challenge it. It's my way or the highway. This is the way scripture is to be interpreted. We've got it right and everybody else is wrong. Their way is the only way. And they see anyone that doesn't agree with them as a potential threat. In one of the Charlie Brown comic strips, Lucy is talking to Charlie Brown one evening and she says, you know, Charlie Brown, I think I would make a good evangelist. And Charlie Brown says, well, why do you say that, Lucy? And Lucy says, well, <coughs> today at school, I was talking about religion with a boy in my class, and he belongs to a different denomination than I do. And I convinced him that my denomination was right and his denomination was wrong. And Charlie Brown says, well, why did you do that, Lucy? And Lucy said, I hit him with my lunchbox so he agreed with me. <laughs> now, we've all probably been hit with a few religious lunchboxes in our day, haven't we? We know people like that. We know how they are. One of the sure giveaways of bad religion is that people who practice bad religion are not open to new truth. They're afraid of discussion. They're afraid of study. They're afraid of questioning. It's, it's their way or no way. Another characteristic of adherence of bad religion is that they will go to any extreme to keep women out of positions of authority. They are adamantly opposed <coughs> to equal rights for women, and they feel threatened by women in positions of authority. Uh, they will go to any extreme to keep women in their place, as they like to put it. And anyone who advocates for women's rights, anyone who works for equal rights for women, is seen as a threat to their world and someone who must be branded an enemy and kept in their place. Another characteristic of bad religion is that adherents of these types of groups have authoritarian leaders. Authoritarian leaders that tell them what to believe, what to do, 